Welcome to this CME activity focused on the interpretation of peripheral arterial ultrasound. I have no financial or other disclosures. The societies of vascular medicine and vascular ultrasound have developed standardized nomenclature for use in describing peripheral arterial ultrasound patterns. The three fundamental major descriptors are flow direction, phasicity, and resistance. Qualifying modifiers are also useful and pertinent in determining the nature of arterial disease. Taking a focused view of flow direction, ultrasound detects antegrade flow, retrograde flow, and bidirectional flow. When the ultrasound transducer is correctly oriented, the baseline serves as the determinant for antegrade versus retrograde flow. The left image demonstrates a standard display of normal net antegrade flow in a peripheral artery. On the right, a unique bidirectional flow pattern is captured, with above and below baseline signal evident. Phasicity is another key flow signal characteristic. You may recognize the variable nomenclature here. Multiphasic is now largely accepted and in use, having replaced triphasic and biphasic terminology. However, it's still acceptable and correct to use triphasic as a waveform descriptor. Multiphasic waveforms cross the baseline, which represents zero flow. Forward and reverse velocities will be present in multiphasic waveforms. As peripheral arterial disease advances, the waveform in a disease segment will gradually lose phasicity until only a monophasic signal is detected, reflecting only unidirectional antegrade flow through the cardiac cycle. The final major descriptor is resistance. Broadly speaking, arteries can demonstrate high, intermediate, or low resistance patterns. The vascular bed being supplied by the interrogated artery is a major determinant of the waveform appearance. Arteries which supply resting skeletal muscle will normally demonstrate a high resistance waveform. A dense arteriolar bed in the skeletal muscle causes relative impedance of forward blood flow, thus causing high resistance upstream. Let's focus in on this high resistance waveform. Classically, you will observe a sharp upstroke in velocity with systole, followed by the normal brief flow reversal in early diastole. The high resistance encountered in the distal arterial bed within arterioles and capillaries contributes to the absence of detected signal between waveforms representing absence of flow. In comparison, a low resistance waveform shows a sloping upstroke and pan-diastolic flow without the early diastolic flow reversal. These qualities of the duplex tracing are directly correlated to low resistance of the tissue bed downstream. To recap before our case review, a normal triphasic waveform is the result of arterial flow pattern through the cardiac cycle. The early antegrade signal is generated by flow during systole. An early diastolic flow reversal is then detected, followed by a short duration of lower amplitude flow signal, the reflected wave related to vascular compliance, after which flow ceases through the remainder of diastole. In arterial pathologic states, the severity of luminal stenosis will result in a continuum of waveform morphology alterations. Diminished peak systolic velocity, often with sloping of the upstroke, loss of the normal early diastolic flow reversal, and then full transition to a low amplitude monophasic waveform can be expected. In the extremities, delayed upstroke with a sloping pattern reflects disease proximal to the site of interrogation. The late forward flow may be diminished or absent, contributing to the biphasic appearance. When the stenotic lesion is distal to the site of interrogation, resistance increases, and the first antegrade systolic waveform broadens. Turbulent flow within a narrowed segment contributes to this spectral broadening. Diastolic flow reversal is lost, and the reflected wave is diminished or absent. Let's begin our case review. This is a familiar tracing. Here's a normal superficial femoral artery. Antegrade flow with systole is detected with a sharp upstroke. Multiphasic signal is subsequently detected, and the tracing indicates a high-resistance artery, which is typical for the SFA. To reinforce normal, again we see a multiphasic high resistance tracing with net antegrade flow and no evidence of turbulent flow to suggest stenosis. 
On the absolute opposite end of the disease spectrum, as you'd expect, there's no arterial flow or spectral tracing in a case of arterial occlusion. On this color Doppler, you can see color flow signal in the adjacent femoral vein, but there's no detectable flow in the SFA. In early or mild peripheral arterial disease, because the distalmost arterial units sustain the earliest detectable damage, resistance in the capillary and arteriolar beds is diminished, and pandiastolic flow will be detected. A mild degree of spectral broadening occurs during the systolic phase, and peak systolic velocity becomes elevated as a result of decreased arterial compliance. Stenotic lesions with less than 50% luminal loss will also result in mildly increased peak systolic velocities. The waveform maintains a multiphasic pattern, but with decrease in the duration of early diastolic flow reversal. Continuing with a less than 50% stenosis, upstroke of the systolic phase remains rapid or sharp, but spectral broadening occurs as the normal laminar flow pattern is disrupted and turbulence occurs. With approximately 50% stenosis, the waveform in this popliteal artery is multiphasic but has lost the final antegrade flow signal due to loss of arterial compliance causing a biphasic appearance. The spectral tracing maintains the expected late diastolic absence of signal. Grayscale imaging confirms the presence of plaque with luminal compromise, and while transverse plane grayscale is optimal for the confirmation of stenotic degree, stenosis can still be approximated at 50% based on the waveform and grayscale appearance of the lumen. With progressive luminal loss, there is a shift to monophasic waveform patterns. The early diastolic flow reversal is absent and spectral broadening intensifies as a consequence of turbulent blood flow. Continuous pan-diastolic flow will be detected in this setting in association with downstream loss of resistance. In this case, the sonographer was able to quantify the degree of luminal stenosis on grayscale imaging as well, confirming 50 to 74% stenosis. In another example of greater than 50% stenotic disease, again we see a monophasic flow pattern with turbulent flow manifesting as spectral broadening. Pan-diastolic flow is present. The systolic upstroke remains sharp there is loss of the early diastolic flow reversal. Grayscale and color Doppler confirm at least 50% stenosis or greater. This excellent case demonstrated both grayscale confirmation of extensive plaque with approximately 50% stenosis and a classic waveform showing monophasic antegrade flow, spectral broadening, and pan-diastolic flow. This patient's extensive disease involved the external iliac through popliteal arteries with a nearly identical waveform at each segment. Distal to a severe stenosis, the classic tardis parvus waveform may be encountered. This is characterized by a markedly sloped upstroke with a small, smooth, and rounded systolic peak. Findings reflect severely diminished degree of flow through the narrowed upstream arterial segment. Similarly, this tracing is a little noisier than the previous, but again demonstrates tardis parvus characteristics. Keep attention out for this classic waveform. If a proximally occluded artery isn't sufficiently collateralized distal to the occlusive lesion, you will either see no detectable flow on spectral Doppler or a faint signal can be detected. Color Doppler may not perceive or display flow, but spectral interrogation may still indicate some degree of arterial supply. In this case, the patient's common femoral artery is actually collateralized, but the waveform is grossly abnormal with a diminished peak systolic velocity and pan-diastolic flow. This has similarity to the tardis parvus waveform we just reviewed. In this patient, superficial femoral artery occlusion was encountered, but as is often seen, profundofemoris collaterals reconstituted the popliteal artery distally. The waveform is abnormal, but flow is detected. Clearly, the amplitude is severely diminished. And now, let's take a look at some really neat cases to close us out. This looks familiar, right? I love this Sine loop. 
The sonographer captured a textbook case of bidirectional flow within this partially thrombosed common femoral artery pseudoaneurysm. Earlier in the deck, I showed you this characteristic tracing. This is a very clear case of bidirectional flow within a pseudoaneurysm. The prolonged duration of flow reversal exceeds that of any other pattern of flow reversal in a normal or atherosclerotic artery. Together with the definitively bidirectional color Doppler appearance and the grayscale findings of this lesion, you can feel confident calling a pseudoaneurysm every time. In contradistinction, in an arteriovenous fistula, there is actual mixing of arterial and venous blood leading to a classic waveform of its own. This exam was performed as a venous duplex ultrasound. The first remarkable finding is the arterialization of the venous waveform. You can see the venous tracing in the background, punctuated by a systolic peak we expect to see in the adjacent common femoral artery, and that's exactly what this is. The color Doppler demonstrates mixing of common femoral artery and vein blood flow. Grayscale imaging proves us right, with a narrow fistula detected between the artery and vein. In addition, the common femoral vein diameter exceeds expectations as a consequence of high flow state from arterialization. The patient underwent CT prior to the ultrasound. The left common femoral vein is dilated and asymmetrically enhancing on this arterial phase study. A very narrow channel connects the artery and vein. Moving centrally in the body, we're going to look at progressive ultrasound changes with progression of subclavian arterial disease. I just recently read this case and made the subtle finding of a type 1 subclavian steel waveform. This is an early imaging manifestation of subclavian steel phenomenon. The more prominent waveform abnormality is an early diastolic notch. Harder to see but still present is a mid-systolic deceleration. This spectral Doppler tracing of a left vertebral artery shows an atypical biphasic morphology with a key mid-systolic deceleration. There is a sudden sharp flow deceleration during peak systolic velocity reflecting a drop in pressure at the stenotic segment of the subclavian artery. Subsequently, a second but diminished systolic peak will be seen. Findings represent a later stage of subclavian steel recognized as a type 4 waveform. In subclavian disease progression, the vertebral artery tracing makes a definitive change to complete flow reversal. The waveform remains low resistance, but the direction of flow is away from the transducer on the color Doppler image reflecting caudally directed flow to supply the subclavian artery distal to stenosis. This spectral Doppler displays a low resistance pattern below the baseline. CT angiography confirms the left subclavian artery occlusion at the origin with reconstitution by the left vertebral artery. And finally, I encourage you to keep alert for unexpected non-arterial findings on spectral Doppler imaging. This was an extremity arterial duplex exam I interpreted with clinical indication of claudication. Notice the irregularly irregular intervals between each waveform at each interrogated arterial segment. No one segment displays a similar waveform interval. This is atrial fibrillation, which I confirmed when I called in the finding. The patient was known to have AFib, but was thought to be back in sinus rhythm. So the finding on this exam prompted additional evaluation and management. I hope you enjoyed this review of peripheral arterial ultrasound interpretation. Thanks for your attention today.